tonight. Making policy on the fly, fighting for needle exchanges. We are living in the public health dark ages here. And... I'd like everyone to reflect on the women in their lives. I mean brands, sorry, brands. In an unusual appearance at the White House, the South Korean National Security Advisor announced that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has offered to meet with President Trump. President Trump appreciated the briefing and said he would meet Kim Jong-un by May. The last round of talks between the U.S. and North Korea stalled out in 2009, and the heads of state of the two sparring countries have never met face to face. As part of the detente, North Korea will suspend missile testing. The Mississippi legislature passed what could become the most restrictive abortion law in the U.S., banning the procedure after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The bill includes some exceptions, for example, if a woman's life or major bodily function is in danger, or if the fetus has a health problem that would keep it from surviving outside the womb. But the bill doesn't make exceptions for cases of rape or incest. Governor Phil Bryant has expressed his support for the measure, saying he wants his state to, quote, be the safest place in America for an unborn child. Mississippi's only abortion clinic, Jackson Women's Health Organization, has already threatened to sue if Bryant signs it into law. Eleven countries met in Chile today to sign one of the largest free trade agreements in the world, and the U.S. wasn't a part of it. Even though the rebranded deal has a smaller reach without the U.S. participating, it still covers around 500 million people and gets rid of barriers on about 13% of global trade. At times of rising protectionism, what we have achieved constitutes a significant political message to the Asia-Pacific region and to the rest of the world. 21 people have gotten medical attention in the UK after a former Russian double agent and his daughter were poisoned. Sergei and Yulia Skripal are both hospitalized in critical but stable condition and remain unconscious. A local police officer who responded to the incident is the only other person still in the hospital. Britain's Home Secretary confirmed that experts identified the toxin, but she would only say that it's very rare. The use of a nerve agent on UK soil is a brazen and reckless act. This was attempted murder in the most cruel and public way. This afternoon, a federal judge in Brownsville, Texas, met one-on-one -on -one with a 14-year-old undocumented immigrant to clarify whether she wants an abortion. A federal appeals court ordered the meeting after the Trump administration tried to block it. The Office of Refugee Resettlement has been in and out of court since October, trying and mostly failing to prevent teens in its custody from ending their pregnancies. So far, four of them have joined an ACLU lawsuit against the agency. But the young woman in court today has more urgent business, telling everyone fighting over her care what she wants. After a 2 p.m. private hearing, U.S. District Court Judge Rolando Olvera revealed that after weeks of legal ping pong, a 14-year-old pregnant minor identified as Jane Doe does not want an abortion. In mid-January, while detained in a shelter for immigrant minors, Jane Doe discovered she was six weeks pregnant. A contact in the shelter connected her with attorneys Rochelle and Miles Garza. Rochelle Garza represented the very first Jane Doe, who fought the Trump administration for her right to get an abortion in October. This Jane initially wanted an abortion, and the Garzas became her court-appointed representation. They scheduled a judicial bypass hearing for her, a necessary legal proceeding in order to obtain an abortion in Texas without parental consent. The hearing was scheduled for February 8th, and Jane Doe was a no-show. Federal officials wouldn't bring her to the appointment and said that she suddenly changed her mind. Rochelle and Miles Garza, for weeks, were unable to speak to or sit down with their client to confirm that that was true. As court-appointed representation, the Garzas couldn't just walk away from their client without sitting down with her first. The fact that ORR prevented Jane Doe from ever seeing her lawyers again isn't all that surprising. In an email from March of 2017, the director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, anti-abortion advocate Scott Lloyd, said this in regards to another pregnant minor. 
she should not be meeting with an attorney regarding her termination or otherwise pursuing judicial bypass at this point. Jane's due process, the pro-choice organization that connected this recent Jane Doe to the Garzas, says ORR's attempts to cut off pregnant minors from legal representation is very troubling. What's disturbing about how this case played out is it's confirmed for us that the Office of Refugee Resettlement is not allowing refugees who are interested in having an abortion access to counsel. If they do discuss abortion with counsel, access to counsel is then shut down. That's completely unconstitutional, but they don't care. ORR's decision-making is opaque. Policy action happens in the dark, and the public only finds out what's going on through court documents, leaks, and appearances. So while this Jane's case is closed, there are likely other Janes out there who are going to end up in court. In Iowa, a spike in opioid abuse among people under 30 is causing another public health crisis. Cases of hepatitis C, a virus that attacks the liver, are up 375%. To combat the problem, a group of Iowans has been operating an underground needle exchange. And now, they're lobbying for a bill to legalize that effort. Under state law, it's illegal to possess or distribute clean syringes for an unlawful purpose. This is the group's second attempt at getting a bill through, but some legislators are tough to persuade. So when I moved back home in 2015, it was pretty alarming to realize that there was no coordinated statewide response to our current drug crisis. And so a couple of us had kind of been talking about, you know, what would be cool is maybe if there was a needle exchange here. We're in a garage where uh, volunteers come to pick up supplies for outreach. And so there's a number of supplies in this very messy garage. Because we're sort of a mobile squad, we'll take um, our supplies in little Tupperware containers like this. And so we'll take all the safer injection supplies like cottons and cookers and ties and sterile water, hepatitis C info. And so all that stuff kind of goes into the back of a car. It takes a ton of hours of people power and it's essentially funded out of people's own pockets. This is what needle exchange looks like when you have no support from the government. We are out in the community uh, three days per week providing services at fixed locations and then sometimes doing mobile or backpack outreach. Some days it can be really slow, some days it can be more eventful, it always depends on the weather. Do you want any waters? Is, is that um, purified water? Or? It's Yeah, it's sterile water. So if you put it in your cooker, like it just makes it so that you're not introducing any nasties in the tap water into your shot. Hey, Jafar. One, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, it just feels so frustrating a lot of the time to watch amazing news from other states where they're getting safer consumption facilities, safe injection facilities, and knowing that we don't even have a legal needle exchange program. We are living in the public health dark ages here. Well, in Iowa specifically, the problem that we have is that there's a growing number of individuals under the age of 30 with hepatitis C. Good seeing you back again. Yes, sir. How have you been? I'm doing good. Hepatitis C is a viral infection that can destroy the liver silently over years and even decades. Currently, individuals that are still actively involved in illicit drug use, Iowa Medicaid does not cover the cost of these hepatitis C treatments. Clean needle exchanges are important. In order for us to eliminate hepatitis C, we're going to have to have clean needle exchange. We're going to have to treat early stage disease. I think the bigger fear that I have is those individuals who are at risk for getting the infection but have yet to be diagnosed. 
<laughs> so many of our clients come in, and if we just mention, hey, we have hep C testing, do you want one? People just typically say, yeah, because mo a lot of them have never been tested before. Everyone is just walking around assuming that they have this and that they are transmitting it to other people. Okay. Just talk to me, talk to me, don't okay. think about it. Okay. It's, uh, I've had my ears pierced so many times too. This Come a little be closer a to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we barely need any blood, so it's all good. Oh, well, that wasn't bad at all. So if the test is positive, then we need to go to the public health department and have them do your blood draw and see whether or not you do have the virus or not. Okay, good news. Thank God, because I'm kind of stressing about it. I call my boyfriend and tell him, because he doesn't shoot drugs, and he hates it that I do. And if I get hepatitis C and I give it to him, where else would he have gotten it but from me? So in January of 2017 is when the initial syringe exchange legislation was introduced in Iowa. It was also following the November 2016 election where our state, for the first time in a couple decades, it became dominated by a Republican governor, Republican Senate, and a Republican House. I have a lot of people to grab. They need a lot of pushing and poking and urging from their constituents to move it forward. But yeah, we're hoping that we can get this needle exchange bill through. That's interesting. I've been hearing from him a little bit. The bill just got introduced in the House last Friday, so it's been kind of a like, go, go, go, try to get on these people's list. This is a, the clerk for the representative. There is some opposition to the bill. However, if we're lucky, it will move through the Senate and it will get voted out and it will be on to the House for their review. Uh, I just had a chance to meet with two of the senators on the Republican side, uh, one of whom just doesn't support the bill on sort of moral grounds but was not super engaged or aware of it. Uh, so that was uh, Senator Edler. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's going to be a rough road for the next couple months for us. However, if the bill does pass this year, I was going to move into the modern age of public health. President Trump actually followed through today on his sudden announcement last week that he'd be imposing new tariffs on steel and aluminum. We will have a 25% tariff on foreign steel and a 10% tariff on foreign aluminum. But Trump left himself the option to exempt just about any country he wants, with only the vague requirement that their exports no longer threaten national security. And he exempted Canada and Mexico, our first and fifth largest sources of imported steel, off the bat. So with all these opportunities for carve-outs, it's not totally clear whether the tariffs will actually deliver a long-term boost for the steel and aluminum industries, or just higher prices for consumers. Still, policy experts I spoke to said having exemptions in a trade policy like this isn't unusual, and is actually necessary to make the policy work. What is unusual is the way this was rolled out. Typically, an administration holds a highly orchestrated message event to announce the change in policy. And then weeks or months later, after the public's attention has faded, policymakers quietly and carefully craft exemptions and exclusions. By contrast, Trump seemed to be figuring out how the policy would work as he went along. And that's kind of the new normal for this administration. Look at the ban on transgender people in the military, which Trump announced by tweet evidently without consulting anyone. Look at DACA, which he ended unilaterally, and which he's now criticizing Congress for not restoring fast enough. Look at the successive waves of travel bans. All of those hasty policy announcements have gotten tangled up in court challenges. Because when you rush a major policy announcement and preview it before it's ready via tweet, you leave a lot of holes and a lot of contradictions. And that means a lot of opportunities for opponents of the policy to say the actual intent behind it doesn't match the legal justification you've given, or that the policy does concrete harm to certain people. Governing on impulse is just what you'd expect of Trump. The art of the deal is all about staying unpredictable so that your adversaries don't know how to pin you down. 
But in policymaking, wildcards don't really work. Thank you very much. Because what you get isn't policy, it's chaos. Yesterday, the Prime Minister of Turkey issued a new threat against Western oil and gas exploration in the waters off Cyprus. It's the latest move by the Turkish government to solidify its influence over the island, which is ethnically and politically split between Greeks and Turks. Today, the capital Nicosia is Europe's last divided city. On one side is the Greek-speaking Republic of Cyprus, an independent state with EU membership. On the other is the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is recognized only by Turkey and is an increasingly strategic foothold for President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who's bent on stoking the populist Islamic nationalism that fuels his power. Buradan saldırmaya başladılar aşağıdan. Bu koridordaydı burada çünkü attıkları taşlar buraya gelemezdi bu koridora. When newspaper editor Şenol Event published a headline in January criticizing Erdogan's military operation against the Kurds in Syria, he knew the Turkish government wouldn't like it. Over the years, he's faced plenty of complaints about his left-wing views, but this time was different. <laughs> 500 hardline Turkish nationalists started demonstrating outside Levent's office. Buraya tırmandılar. Zaten attıkları taşlarla bütün bu camları hepsini kırdılar. Hepsi kırıldı. Burası harp meydanına döndü. Gel gel. Gel gel erkeksin gel. Gel hadi. Gel gel buraya erkek. Just the day before President Erdogan openly urged his supporters in Northern Cyprus to retaliate against the paper. Dolayısıyla ben Kuzey Kıbrıslı kardeşlerime Özellikle böyle bir duruşu sergilemek suretiyle ben buraya doğruyu gerçeği yazıyorum. Bunun yazılmasını istemezlerdi ve ben yazdım. Gazetecilik de budur. Do you think that there's still a threat against your life now? Mutlaka tabii ki hala tehlike altındadır. Burası artık Kıbrıs değil, Kıbrıs'ın kuzeyi. Türkiye'dir burası. Nüfusu Türkiye'li nüfustur. Bize empoze ettiği hayat da Türkiye'deki tarzdır, Türkiye'deki hayat tarzıdır. Ve bizi Türkiye burada idare etmeye devam ettikçe ben ve benim gibi olanların hayatı burada hep tehlikededir. A court sentenced six of the attackers to jail time. And moderates have held large pro-democracy demonstrations opposing Ankara's increasingly heavy hand. Turkish Cypriots are largely liberal Muslims and mosque attendance is low. But Turkey's been supporting large-scale mosque building here. Construction on this mosque, with capacity for 3,000, is almost finished. And next door is Hala Sultan Theological College, the only religious school in northern Cyprus. It was built four years ago with Turkish money. Cypriot teachers at the school filed a complaint in December, saying that Turkish teachers were pushing an increasingly conservative brand of education. The Ministry of Education declined to give us permission to film at the school because of the ongoing investigation. When Mr. Erdogan came in power in Turkey, they have been trying to impose a Sunni Islamic uh, sect in Cyprus and changing the culture and the belief and the demography of the uh, northern part of the Cyprus. It's a policy of Turkey. Shana Elchil is president of the Teachers' Union and a vocal opponent of the Erdogan government. What is the purpose of Turkey sending over religious teachers here? What's the purpose of them building state schools like this, which promotes Islam? Brainwashing, changing the belief of the Turkish Cypriots. I can say that this kind of activity is like a cancer cell. All the Turkish Cypriot community are secular people. We don't care about the religion. What's your message to the Turkish government? Hands off from our island. Since the 1970s, thousands of Turkish mainlanders have made Cyprus home. In just the last six months, Erdogan's AKP opened a campaign office in Nicosia, which it says is there to organize 100,000 eligible Turkish voters for his 2019 re-election bid. How long have you lived in northern Cyprus? Is this your home now? Ha Türkiye, 
Ha burası hiç farkı yoktur. Burası da benim evim. Türkiye Cumhuriyeti de benim evimdir. Ayrımız gayrımız yoktur. Hasan Chairs and Association created for Turkish mainlanders living in Cyprus. There are about 850 members of his organization and there are many more like it. Bu gazeteyi, bu hışkırtıcılığı yapan ve hatta bir milletvekili Türkiye'de hükümetle alakalı olarak anayasada açık ve net yazıyor. Hışkırtıcılık diyor, suçtur. suçtur. Bu bir hışkırtmadır. Sayın Cumhurbaşkanı. Are you supporter of President Erdoğan? Hiçbir Kıbrıs Türk'ü nefes alamaz. Güvenlikte, eğitimde, yaşama tarzlarımızda biz Türkiye'ye ne kadar şükretsek azdır. Şu anda İslam ülkelerinin lideri de sayılabilir. Erdoğan'ı destekliyorum, seviyorum. Benimsiyorum da fikirlerini. Who represents you more? Is it President Erdoğan or is it the government of Northern Cyprus? You point into the flag, Turkey. Kesinlikle, tek kelimeyle ve her zaman. March 8th is International Women's Day. So let's take some time now to think about... Brands! Don't forget brands. It's very important amongst Me Too and Time's Up that you don't forget what brands have to contribute to the whole equality thing. And what symbolizes women more than Barbie. In honor of the special day, Mattel launched a new collection of inspiring women, which will be smashing the glass ceiling in no time. The line includes Amelia Earhart, Katherine Johnson, and Frida Kahlo. Frida's iconic unibrow is apparently the one line that Mattel was unwilling to cross in their celebration of women. After extended campaigns to raise their hourly wage to a livable one, McDonald's has finally listened and flipped its M logo to a W. McDonald's says its upside down arches are in honor of the extraordinary accomplishments of women everywhere. Women, take a long look at what McDonald's has done for you. The forward thinking fast food company is also flipping its arches on Twitter where women everywhere can bask in the glory of a flipped JPEG as they dodge men's opinions about whether or not the day is deserved. In an effort to parody what it referred to as failed tone-deaf campaigns that some brands have attempted in order to attract women, brewing company Brewdog did exactly that. Not that women don't already have plenty of options when it comes to drinking. Johnny Walker released a special Jane Walker line to celebrate Women's History Month because the lack of the female form on a bottle was the one thing stopping women from buying whiskey. So on this International Day of the Woman, I'd like everyone to reflect on the women in their lives. I mean brands, sorry, brands, the brands in their lives. Don't know why I keep saying women. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, March 8th.